and so it is with great pleasure that I invite him up to deliver his lecture, Daily Life in Ancient Athens, A View from the Agora. Thank you very much, Phoebe. And thank you both, Christine and Phoebe, for the invitation to speak this evening. Um, I once gave a course in archaeological law and ethics, and we ended up discussing museums a little bit. And I wanted to know how many of my students had been to, so I thought it was only fair to count the number I had been to. And I think it's 300, and those are the ones I remember. But the first one, with the possible exception of the Science Museum and the Children's Museum, uh, was the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston. Uh, I remember coming here uh, when I was five and six years old. Uh, and uh, I, though I have not lived in Boston for a billion years, uh, I am a life member of this museum, and it is, uh, in fact, my favorite. So it is a particular pleasure uh, to be asked uh, to speak to you tonight uh, on uh, the topic uh, of daily life and how we see it uh, in the Agora. Uh, the Agora, of course, most of you will know what it is, uh, but in case you don't, uh, it's basically the center of town in all respects in antiquity, uh, and uh, that means it was the center of daily life almost inconceivable that an Athenian who lived within walking distance of the Agora did not go into it virtually every day. Uh, it's basically a big open square, and it's multifunctional. You could go down one day, and they would have it set up as a marketplace. You could go down the next day, and there would be uh, a festival going on, a parade going through. Go down the third day, and there might be an election. The next day, athletic contests, the day after that uh, a theatrical performance, the day after that a religious procession, you name it. Uh, and uh, the Agora is where they did it because that was where they could get all the citizens together. Uh, the area uh, that you see on the screen here represents the excavations of this area by the American School of Studying, Studies excuse me, at Athens. Uh, which has been operating in the area for 87 years. So it's a long, slow business. Uh, and that is because pretty much everything you see on the screen in the foreground there, all that greenery and those buildings, when we began, was covered with modern houses. So to dig what I'm going to show you this evening, we have removed about 300 houses from modern Athens. Then we dug down about 20 feet to expose the archaeological remains, uh, and then it was landscaped as an archaeological park. Uh, and uh, this is the view of the area from the Acropolis uh, with the characteristic and well-known temple that is we call the Hephaestion, but everybody else in Athens calls the Theseian. Uh, and the name, though incorrect, sticks to the building like a limpet, and we can't do anything about it. Uh, and then the building on the extreme right with the red roof uh, is our reconstructed museum, and the square lies between those two. Uh, if you look at it uh, from a bird's eye view in antiquity, you have the Acropolis at the lower right, you have some of the city walls and the main gate into Athens at the upper left, and between the two, uh, you have the open square of the Agora, which you can see, I hope, Nope. Yes, right there, uh, right in the middle of the Panathenaic Way, which starts at the city gate here, has a big processional way that runs right through the middle of the square and takes you up to the Acropolis. And that is the root, of course, of the great procession held in honor of Athena uh, on her birthday. But you can see the Agora right in the middle, and again, uh, think away that building, think away that building. Those are Roman, and they got there later. Once you take those away, then you'll see you have a big open square uh, surrounded by buildings. And since the Athenians met there virtually every day, it's around the sides of the square those buildings were built, and they are all public or civic buildings. 
So we are digging essentially <clears throat> the uh, birthplace uh, and place where democracy was first uh, invented and practiced. Uh, and uh, it is uh, this area that we want to talk about because there are both some extraordinary similarities between how things were done in antiquity and how, and then amazing uh, differences uh, in how they are done, and it's worth studying both. It, it really is amazing, except for the technology, how little has changed since antiquity. And that is one of the themes uh, that we will be looking at when we consider Athenian life. Uh, a lot of it will be surprisingly familiar. Uh, the second thing uh, that we uh, also it's, uh, used to do, I don't know if we do it as much, uh, but the Athenians were a wildly competitive people and they did everything in the form of trying to beat everybody else uh, and there were contests in everything you can possibly imagine and this certainly is one of the reasons why this was such a successful society. And the third thing that we will run into is how very participatory everything was in daily life and antiquity. Uh, everybody did everything all the time. They were extremely busy uh, in running uh, their daily uh, lives, both public and private. Uh, so if we move uh, from the bird's eye view to the model, uh, here you can see the great open square uh, and around it the buildings you need to run the government. There is the chief magistrate's office, there is the senate building, there is the archive building. Because nothing has changed since antiquity, the round building right next to that is the senate dining chamber where the politicians were fed at public expense. Uh, there's a bureau of standards, there's a mint, there are law courts. Uh, so we have all of political life, all of administrative life somewhere in the immediate vicinity and I cannot resist uh, comparing ancient democracy and modern democracy because time and time again, uh, I am reminded by everybody that it's not a true democracy uh, because women didn't vote and they had slaves. And that is absolutely true. Uh, on the other hand, for those who were part of the system, uh, it was far more democratic. We make such a fuss nowadays about free elections and how that's the keystone of democracy, uh, and that's absolute nonsense. Uh, the Athenians elected almost nobody. They allotted people. They pulled names out of a hat. And I want you to consider for a minute, if instead of <coughs> electing our Congress of 500 members, we simply opened up the phone book and picked 500 people, uh, could we do any worse <laughs> than, than, than what we have today with that uh, amazing group of people that we've assembled in Washington by the public will? Uh, we would have 40 wackos on the left, we would have 40 wackos on the right, and you would have 420 people in the middle trying to make decent laws. And in Athens, at least, they would do it for only one year, and then it would be somebody else's turn. So there, again, is both a similarity and a difference uh, between what uh, we see when we look back from the Agora. And in some instances, it's clear that we've given up some things that we might want to take back again, uh, simply because it probably worked better then. Uh, and uh, what we want to start with, of course, is the usual definition of the Agora as the marketplace. Uh, and because uh, this big square could be set up with booths, temporary booths would be set up here. Some of the buildings around the edge are commercial. Uh, and we have evidence that the Athenians administered their economy uh, and commercial activity uh, fairly uh, rigorously. Here you see, for instance, a set of public dry measures for selling grain or nuts. And these were kept in the buildings around the Agora so that after you bought your kilo of nuts and you thought you'd been cheated, you could go into the Bureau of Standards and you could check to see that in fact uh, you had been given uh, the proper amount. Uh, here is a more detailed one. And we know they're public measures 
because you can see the validating stamp following the coin type right here and the start of the painted inscription that runs around this one which starts here and says de Mossion, public property, uh, so that they're keeping good track uh, that the uh, consumer is not being cheated uh, too badly. Uh, here are the uh, weights and measures, uh, here are the weights, uh, and you will see a set of these when you go up to the magnificent new galleries that we are celebrating today, those galleries uh, on uh, ancient life in Greece and private life in Greece. Or, uh, and here you see some of the ones uh, that we have from the Agora. Uh, <clears throat> these here are the special ones uh, because they're of bronze, that's why they're a different color, uh, and they are official. Uh, and they have a symbol on them in case you're in a hurry or you don't read so well so that you know that the knuckle bone, uh, the shield, or the turtle uh, should weigh a certain amount. And if there's any question, there's an inscription right there telling you uh, how much it weighs. And on the side, there's another inscription once again saying it's Demosian, it's public property. And then you see the lead equivalents here with some of those <coughs> same symbols uh, here is a knuckle bone, there is a turtle, uh, and again with the inscriptions on them. These are the lead ones used by the merchants in the marketplace. And again, if you thought you were being cheated, uh, you could simply take whatever you had just bought, go in and check your kilo of whatever it was against the official standards, uh, which were available uh, to all shoppers as needed. Uh, and uh, they went farther than that. Other commodities were also checked fairly carefully. Uh, here uh, is an example of a standard in order to make sure that the roof tiles you bought to cover your house uh, were of the proper size. And you see here uh, the marble uh, mold or standard for a clay tile. That's the roofing tile itself. Uh, they would be laid in rows going down the slope of the roof and then much narrower ones would be put uh, over the joints, the cover ones, uh, so you would have a series of big flat tiles and then these little cover tiles so that water couldn't get in under the roof and you should be able to get them uh, of the same size over and over and over again. Uh, and this here uh, is a very fine example of which there are two others I think known in the ancient world, again for regulating uh, the commerce in the marketplace. Uh, booths were set up in the marketplace, but they also had special buildings. Uh, and this is a particularly nice one. It's been reconstructed to serve as our museum, but in terms of familiarity with antiquity, uh, it uh, checks two separate boxes. Uh, this building was built uh, by a man who studied in Athens when he was still a prince, and he went on to be a king uh, in Asia Minor and a successor of Alexander the Great. His name was Attalus, but before he became king, while he was still young, he studied under the philosophers of Athens, under the philosopher Carniades. He went home, and like many other princes of these royal houses, he gave the Athenians this handsome building pretty much in appreciation of his happy college days here in Athens. And this is an alumnus gift. Uh, and uh, what he gave them uh, was this magnificent market building because when you look at the inside, you've got a beautiful double row of colonnades uh, to cool everybody off. Uh, and then you get a series of doorways here leading into a series of separate rooms. There are 21 rooms on the ground floor. There are 21 rooms on the second floor. So it is 42 shops on two levels under a single roof and we have a name for that kind of establishment. Most of us would call it a mall. Uh, so this is the world's first shopping center, if you will, uh, set up along the sides of the square, serving as the main commercial center of Athens <coughs> for more than 400 years. Uh, to consider just some of the commodities that could be bought here and the professions that we have some information about, uh, you see here a black figure painting, a, a, a pot, uh, of a carpenter, excuse me, a cobbler at work cutting a sandal for a young man. And you see here uh, a relief, uh, actually a whole big stele, given to a hero 
uh, by the name of Kali Stefanos, about whom we know nothing else at all, uh, but the man who gave it uh, was uh, a uh, cobbler. Uh, and the top part there, which you can't see so well there, you can see a little better here, you get the whole shop in action. And you can see uh, several people at work. Down here you can see the table that they're working on and sandals that have been put there, people working on sandals, a row of sandals hanging from the beam above them, an old man either putting up or taking down one, and uh, a young boy cutting strips of leather. So you don't need much imagination to imagine walking into one of these little shops uh, and seeing uh, just how it worked. And it looks very, very familiar uh, for anybody who has walked through uh, pretty much any of the marketplaces of Europe, uh, Africa, or, or Asia, uh, where you see the work and then you buy the goods right there. We also have the remains of a cobbler's workshop right by the Agora, because you have down here a boundary stone for the square, and then you have the wall of a private house of the 5th century BC here, and when we dug in this area, which was the courtyard of this house, uh, we got out uh, this sort of material. Uh, there are a series of bone eyelets for the laces, and a series of large-headed, short-shafted nails of the type that you would use for making sandals. So we have good reason to believe we have a cobbler working in that shop <clears throat> just uh, outside the square, uh, and found just outside the house was this, <clears throat> excuse me, large fragment of a drinking cup uh, carrying the name, presumably the owner in the genitive case, basically saying, I belong to Simon. So this should be the establishment of Simon the cobbler, who was active in the fifth century BC, uh, and then we turn to Diogenes Laertius, uh, who tells us in his Lives of the Philosophers that when Socrates wanted to meet with those students who were too young to go into the Agora, uh, he would meet them at the shop of Simon the Cobbler, which lay near the Agora. And the evidence is circumstantial, but we seem to have a fifth century cobbler at work. Uh, we seem to think his name is Simon, and he certainly worked as close to the Agora as you could possibly be. Uh, so we take those miserable remains uh, to be <clears throat> one of the informal uh, schools used by Socrates uh, because the young men couldn't meet him in the open square because they had not yet done their military service and they were not yet full-fledged citizens. Uh, for other commodities, we have other sources. Uh, and this is one example. Uh, and you see here, if you like crossword puzzles, and you will love Greek epigraphy, uh, because they don't give you even a quarter of the clues, but you're supposed to fill in the blanks anyway. So you see here uh, part of a large inscription, uh, and that's several dozen pieces there, and they all have to be put together as best you can do it. We have 10 of these stelae, uh, and these are particularly interesting ones. They were erected in 414 BC, uh, and they represent <clears throat> the public sale by auction uh, of the property of people who had been convicted either of profaning the Eleusinian mysteries or of mutilating the Herms, statues that stood everywhere in Athens. And it's like a catalog uh, of both your attic uh, and your grandmother's pantry. It's got, they sold absolutely everything, this piece here, uh, is this corner one here, and you can maybe make out the letters. Uh, they're in this group from that house. They sold, sold excuse me, uh, six beds. Uh, they sold four tables, two boxes, two uh, stools, one throne, an iron lamp, uh, and one uh, wooden bushel measure. And it goes on and on, telling us all the commodities you could expect to find in an Athenian house, uh, and uh, roughly how much they were worth uh, when they were sold at auction. <clears throat> and amongst the things sold here, unfortunately, <clears throat> were uh, slaves. And several slaves are mentioned here, several dozen. Uh, but when you look at that a little bit more, it's sort of interesting and sort of ambiguous. This is the Erechtheion, of course, up on the Acropolis. We have a wonderful building inscription uh, that tells us moment by moment 
how they finished off this building uh, after they'd stopped working on it for about a decade. They went back in 409 and they finished off the building and they tell you in great detail uh, how they did it and how much it cost so that to flute one of these columns uh, took five men uh, 22 days. And so one person could do it in about, he could do three a year if he did nothing else. But what is interesting, leaving aside the economics of Greek temple building, which is an interesting topic, uh, for our purposes, what is interesting is the social structure, because on those columns, you find Athenian citizens working side by side with Greeks from other cities who were not Athenians and slaves. And they were all paid the same daily wage of one drachma, regardless of their status. So the workforce of the great Periclean building programs were very much a mixture of Athenians, Greeks from elsewhere, uh, and slaves. Uh, and uh, in the uh, museum display, when you go in, you will see that the curators have wisely uh, chosen some themes that they want to emphasize. Uh, they have family, women, war, athletics, livelihoods, and remembrance. Uh, and I want to show you one or two of the themes as we see them from the Agora. And I want to also mention a couple of themes about we, which we are unqualified to have any useful opinion at all. But the first one uh, is family. And this has to do, of course, with identity. And this is a building, one of the few buildings uh, or structures that stood within the open square itself. All the public buildings are actually outside the square. But this one here uh, is, uh, represents your identity as a citizen. You had to be, as of 507 BC, you had to be registered in one of 10 tribes. And that tribe had to say, yes, your father and yes, your mother uh, were members of that city or that community before you became a citizen. Once you were a member of that tribe, everything you did as a citizen was done in tribal contingents. You served in the Senate in a tribal contingent. You fought in the army in a tribal contingent. Uh, you uh, had uh, your own tribal hero that you shared, not with most of the Athenians, but just with the 10% who were in your tribe. And what this is here is the real example, the good example, uh, of why, if you were an Athenian, you went into the city every day. Uh, because uh, what you have is a great big high base. These are life-size statues, uh, each one representing one of these mythical early heroes of Athens after whom the tribes were named. And beneath the tribal statues, you find notices hung up by officials and magistrates beneath the appropriate tribal statue. And those were notices concerning members of your tribe, military conscriptions, public honors, upcoming legal events where you might be a defendant or a, defendant or a plaintiff, proposed legislation. This, in the days before radio and television, telephones uh, and newspapers, and all those electronic things you're carrying in your pockets, before all those existed, this is how information uh, was disseminated by setting up the notices uh, below the appropriate statue of the eponymous hero where every Athenian could come and find out his duties and privileges as a citizen. Uh, what we can't talk about very much uh, are the women. Uh, we will talk about them a little bit, uh, but they do not show up very much in the public square of Athens. Uh, they were not uh, big participants uh, in public life. Uh, they had private duties at home. They had some other duties we'll talk about in a minute. And they were also very important in cult as priestesses uh, for some of the religious activities. Uh, and this stele here uh, comes uh, from a gravestone. And that is the other thing we're not going to talk about very much. Uh, and that is uh, burials and cemeteries uh, and things of that sort. Uh, because you were not allowed to build with, excuse me, to bury within the city walls of Athens. And the Agora is 500 meters away from the city wall. 
Uh, and interestingly enough, this is a modern concept. We also talk about the Agaraz area of the excavations. In the excavations, we have 400 sculpted reliefs that are gravestones. And we have 1,100 inscribed stelae that are gravestones. So in our collection, we have 1,500 pieces of marble, all of which migrated at later times into the Agora, where they were built into Roman houses, Byzantine houses, Turkish houses, and where we find them when we dig the upper levels. There are 1,500 antiquities, not one of which stood within 500 meters of where we found it. So we have lots of gravestones. We do not have the cemeteries uh, where the graves were that they were intended to mark. Uh, for the women, uh, you have uh, this little building here. Uh, they ran the house, and when they left the house, one of the things they did, and they were expected and allowed to do, uh, was to go to the fountain house and collect water. The houses themselves uh, had wells, uh, and in our excavations, we have found 450 wells, and we love them, and the students love them. I know it doesn't look like it here, uh, but in fact, there is a big electric pump down there with him, and there's uh, a hose running here to get the water out of this well and into this cistern. Uh, and uh, he normally, they dig up to the waist or chest in water, and then they ask for the pump to be turned on, but that's up to them. But it's like a time capsule. People drop things into their wells, uh, and then the material is there forever. So if you're digging a well, you're going to find lots of good things. And up on the surface, it's about 100 degrees. Down there, it's about 55. And you're in the water, so it's like a day at the beach when everybody else is digging on the surface. So in fact, it looks like we're abusing him terribly, uh, but we're not. But the picture is on here just to remind us that the normal household supply for water was out of one of these wells or possibly a cistern catching water off the roof. Uh, but the other way of doing it was to go to the fountain house, like that little building we just saw, uh, where you could hold your water jar right under these lion head spouts uh, and fill the water jars with good, fresh, clean water that was being piped in to where you were. And this was uh, the lady's job. And you'll see the pots painted here are exactly the same as the pot on which this scene is painted. It has a handle at the back so you can pour, and it has two side handles so you can lift it up and put it on your head in order to carry it back once you've filled it with water. And at the time that fountain house went in that we were just looking at, there are several dozen of these that are spread throughout the museums uh, of uh, Europe and the United States, and there's a very fine example uh, on display here in the daily life uh, collection. And this one here is particularly nice uh, because you can see all the young ladies are actually identified uh, by these inscriptions as they make their way uh, to and from the fountain house. But otherwise, I regret to say, uh, there isn't gonna be much more uh, that I'm going to tell you about women's life because we're mostly digging the big public buildings right in the center of town. Uh, we're back at our well here just to finish off the kinds of things you can expect to find and the condition in which they are. Uh, that's the take from one well. Actually, it's half the take from one well. Uh, and if you get enough of these pots and it turns out they're all wine jars, you can say, well, this probably isn't a private house. This is probably is a bar. Uh, and this is where people are drinking and having a good time. Uh, lamps to show you they're there at nighttime. Uh, oil lamps, you can see the trace of the burning, and the, some of these bigger jars here with capacities or the contents, what kind of wine you're going to get out of that particular uh, jar. So we get uh, all sorts uh, of interesting things found and associated with the water supply of the city. And we learn other things. We thought this, this well might be for a, a, uh, a bar, uh, and we have more evidence to believe that when we look at other things that were found because <clears throat> we found several dozen of these, <clears throat> which are knuckle bones from the, uh, the hoof of a sheep, uh, from their, their feet. Uh, and they are used like dice or like jacks in antiquity. Uh, they can be simple like this, and you just throw them. You can play with them, uh, like these girls are doing here on a famous painted relief from Herculaneum. 
uh, where they do it pretty much the way they used to when I was growing up. I don't know if anybody plays jacks anymore. If you don't have a rubber bouncy ball, you throw them up in the air and you see how many you can catch on the back of your hand. Uh, and if you can catch more than somebody else, I assume you win. But suffice it to say, uh, these were very, very popular uh, in antiquity, particularly for young girls, but for gaming generally. And some of them uh, would, it would depend on which side they landed on, top, bottom, uh, or the side of the piece. And many of them would carry inscriptions, usually named after deities. And if you throw through three Zeus's, uh, you could probably beat somebody who only threw two Zeus's. Uh, and uh, this is the early form of gambling. These were found, several of these were found in that well, suggesting it really was kind of a place where you went to spend time, just as today you go into a, a uh, shop, uh, an usury or a wine shop in Athens, and you can play a game of backgammon. Uh, the same must have been true in antiquity. They did uh, invent, and very early on, 2000 BC, uh, in Egypt, we're finding regular square dice uh, with the numbers done just the way we do them, so the opposite faces total seven. Uh, this past summer, we found a really weird one. Uh, it's not as illegal as it looks, but it is odd. <laughs> <coughs> but in, and you could, you know, that's not a bad picture. That's the way it looks, uh, and it's not a bad dice, and you can throw it a whole bunch of times, and in fact, the numbers will come out more or less the way they would uh, if it were a cubicle one, but it sure doesn't look it when you first meet it. Uh, but that is not a crooked dice as far as I know. Uh, I want to say briefly uh, that the Athenians and the Greeks generally knew how to relax. Uh, and when you look, we have ways of telling because of festivals and things like that. We know, for instance, that if you served in the Athenian Senate for one year, that you had 120 days off in that year uh, because of various festivals and reasons why the, the Senate should not meet. And that's basically what we have today if you count weekends and holidays. So they worked about as much as we did in terms of time, uh, and uh, they socialized a great deal. They understood something uh, there, there that we sometimes maybe forget a little bit, uh, and that is uh, it doesn't take very much to entertain them. They don't have this slew of things that we have to entertain ourselves. They needed a few friends, they needed a jar of wine, they needed a little bit of bread and cheese, and that was it. Good conversation with good friends was an excellent evening. Uh, and indeed, they have the word for it, the symposium, where you come together in order to drink and spa spend the, pass the time with your friends. And here you see an example of that. This is a man on his way to a party, excuse me. Uh, and in those days, uh, the host provided the wine. He didn't necessarily provide the glasses. So you brought your own drinking cup with you, to judge from all the pictures. So he's on his way to a party. Uh, they uh, liked to be comfortable and they would actually recline when they were having one of these parties. This one's an odd one. It looks like it's a picnic outside. Uh, they're wearing party hats. Uh, I don't quite know what that's about, and we can't find a parallel, and there is nothing sadder in the world than an archaeologist without a parallel, uh, and we don't have any. Uh, and they, they like music, so you have between them uh, this girl uh, sitting on the couch with them playing her double flutes. So very simple. Uh, and very common. They did this uh, quite a lot, as near as we can tell. They were very, very uh, social people, and they knew how to enjoy each other's company. Uh, and here, another one vase, but the two sides of it. Here's an, uh, an older man, you can tell that because of his beard, uh, going to the party with a basket. You can guess whatever's in there, I don't think we know. Uh, and his, his guitar. He's going to play a song or two for them. Uh, here is a young man uh, who had too much fun uh, at the party, uh, and he is dealing with the effects uh, of too much liver, li liquor uh, in the traditional way. So again, you get a clear sense uh, of the social life of the Athenians, and this is definitely part of daily life, uh, and it's worth keeping in mind uh, that they knew how to do that. Other aspects of public life, just briefly, are some of the ones that are mentioned and seen in the, uh, the display galleries here. Uh, the Agora 
was thought to be a very good place. It's a big open square. It's got this big street here. It was a great place for training a major branch of the Athenian government, uh, the war, excuse me, the Athenian army, and that is uh, the cavalry. Uh, and cavalrymen uh, had to have a horse capable of fighting a battle, uh, but uh, they didn't necessarily have to provide all their own armor. Uh, and here you see a series of tokens identified, little lead tokens identified by letters of the Greek alphabet. And when you look on the flip side, uh, you see the kind of armor that they could draw from the state arsenal when they had been summoned to go out to battle. Uh, they could get uh, greaves to protect their legs. They had breastplates, uh, a shield, and over here, a helmet. Uh, so we have evidence uh, of the uh, cavalry uh, being administered somewhere in the Agora. Uh, the other thing that is mentioned in the display here and that is worth thinking about, uh, and that is uh, the athletic contests. If they weren't participating themselves, they liked to watch sports a lot. And again, they had very few opportunities compared to what we have today. There was very little sensory overload in antiquity. Uh, and the Athenians had the fifth most important series of games in Greece, and their differences from the first four are really interesting. The earliest and most important are the Olympic Games, and then there are the Pythian Games at Delphi, the Nemean Games, and the Isthmian Games. And those four sets of games, all associated with sanctuaries, uh, were uh, like, uh, in tennis or golf terms, the Grand Slam. If you won one of those as an athlete, you were set for life. Uh, the fifth one uh, was the, were the Panathenaic Games in Athens, founded in 566 BC. And here, it's interesting to consider uh, how sports might reflect the politics, because the first four sets, the Olympic Games, Delphi Games, uh, the Pythian Games, uh, the Isthmian Games, and the Nemean Games, uh, they are highly aristocratic. In all those games, for hundreds of years, there was not a single contest that wasn't for individual achievement. There were no team sports. Uh, there were, secondly, no prizes of value. You got a crown. The crown was made literally of olive leaves or oak leaves or pine leaves, and that was it. That was the total prize you were given for winning the games. Your city, when you went back home, might honor you and help you out uh, financially, but you didn't get it just by winning the games at all. And third, uh, there was a prize for first place, and everybody went home a, win a loser. There was no second, third, fourth, nothing like that at all. When you get to Athens, uh, what you find is a very different uh, way of looking at uh, rewarding athletes because the first thing you notice is there are prizes of value. And you could be given money, you could be given a cow to sacrifice and eat, you could be given all sorts of things, a uh, gold crown. Uh, but the commonest one, and you'll see several of these on display here, the commonest type, oh, excuse me, were the uh, amphoras that you see here, these two-handled jars that were made specially for the prize that was going to be given to the athlete, uh, and that was olive oil. And depending on how important the event was, you would be given 10 or 20 or 100 amphoras of olive oil and in these specially made jars where on one side you would have a picture of the goddess Athena, and usually an inscription saying from the games at Athens, so there's no question about identifying them. On the other side, uh, you would have a picture of the event uh, for which the olive oil was a prize. So there are prizes of value. Uh, there are uh, prizes that go down to fifth place, more than one winner. Uh, and there are team sports and prizes for those teams. So if you were going to be an athlete for the Olympic Games, you had to have money in order to compete. But if you competed in Athens, uh, there were enough prizes and enough prizes of money and enough team sports that many, many more people could afford to participate than in the great games. So the Panathenaic Games are interesting. Here is another victory monument from a Panathenaic game. And here the tribes, and we talked about the tribes at the beginning, are competing 
in cavalry displays, and all the people in the tribe, or the best riders in the tribe, are running, excuse me, riding in unison, uh, competing against other tribes. And this is a victory monument set up by a tribe that won one of these uh, events known as the Amphipasia. This is only, this piece is about this big. It's a big chunk of marble, but it's less than a quarter of the whole monument. And we know that because on the back side, uh, you find uh, there's our piece way over there, just that much. Originally, there would have been 15 or 20 horsemen riding along. And we know that because on the back, uh, you see just the ankle of a lion uh, inscribed down here and an inscription telling us that the tribe of Leontis, the lion tribe, won the victory. And so you have a whole sculpted lion here. Uh, and then on the basis of this, on symmetry, you have to put in some more space here. And so you come out with this great big cavalry display. And what's sort of fun about this is the detail, because if you look here, it matches just what Xenophon says you should do when you're training your cavalry. Because you will see uh, that the last man bringing up the rear, coming out of the, right out of the background, is an elderly man with a beard. And all the other riders are the youths who are being trained and the ones who have the energy to fight in the cavalry. <clears throat> and Xenophon tells us that when you send out your cavalry, you want to put your very best rider to lead them into battle in the front, and you put your second best rider at the back, just in case something goes wrong and you have to turn around in a hurry and get out of there, you have an experienced man leading you out of the way. And that's exactly what's being shown here, a bunch of, of young horsemen uh, and their second best leader uh, ready to lead them if they all decide for some reason they have to go in the other direction. The last thing I want to talk about is education because that's part of daily life, and it's one of the things that certainly set the Athenians apart. Uh, the most famous uh, educational establishment is out here, way outside the city walls, right about there, about a mile out of town. Founded in a gymnasium, uh, was and named after that gymnasium, was Plato's philosophical school known as the Academy in 388 BC. Uh, it still lies under the modern city of Athens. Uh, but we know where it is. If you gave me about $4 million and a lot of permission, I could find you and dig you the academy in a decade or so, uh, because uh, this was found in 1967, Horos Tes Hecademias, the boundary of the academy. So we know where it is. We have to fuss a little bit whether it's over this way or that way, uh, but we have the edge of the academy, which was really important for Athenian daily life and how they train their citizens. Uh, here uh, are our modern excavations, and we have another uh, philosophical school down here. It's still under a modern building. We dug two ends of the building, and we still have a lot more digging to do right in there. It's a famous building. It started life, really, uh, as the world's first public art museum. On the back wall of the building, uh, built about 470 BC, were some very fine panel paintings. There's a lot of good art before 70 BC, 470 BC, but it's in the king's palace, it's in the royal tombs, it's in the holy of holies of the temple. It's not for you and me, and we don't get to see it. But here, uh, it's put into a stoa, a building that has no doors, and there are 22 intercolumnar entrances here where you can walk in. This is the main square right here. This is essentially the most public building in Athens. Uh, and these paintings are put on the back wall of it to invite people in to look at them. And unlike all the other buildings I showed you on the model at the beginning, this building has no function. All the other buildings, certain activities take place at certain times under certain magistrates like the archives or the law courts or whatever you want. This building is built and used as a hangout. And that means uh, if your trade requires a crowd or an audience, this is like shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, because you come here and you're going to find 100 Athenians, 200 Athenians. Not one of them can say they're too busy to talk to you or listen to you. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the building at all. They are goofing off if they're in that building. And if you're a juggler, a sword swallower, or a beggar, this is where you're going to go to get some action. 
And amongst those who needed a crowd or an audience were the philosophers. When Zeno comes to Athens from Cyprus in 300 BC, he looks around and he considers where to set up shop. He picks the most public building in Athens, uh, the painted stoa, uh, and uh, meets here where you can find Athenians every day to listen to him. And with a matter of months, from their classroom, they are known as the Stoics. And this is the very building that gives that branch of Western philosophy its name. Uh, and that is what uh, we have been digging for. It was also uh, going on our theme of remembrance, which you will find in the galleries. It is where the Athenians, the paintings, showed mostly military exploits. And the building itself carried memorials of military success. Here you see uh, a bronze shield, which carries a punched inscription up here, uh, saying this was taken from the Spartans at Pylos. And a certain amount of the uh, weaponry would simply be dedicated uh, to uh, public display and was up there for hundreds of years. Uh, here is the base in the form of captured enemy weapons uh, of a st for a statue of a Roman general who helped the Athenians. And this was set up appropriately enough uh, the best place to set this up, and you can see it's made up of a series of shields, uh, leather cuirasses, uh, the handle of a sword here, and then the statue goes up this way here, uh, and uh, it is the, the victorious general standing on the armor that he captured, uh, and uh, that was found right here uh, in front of the painted stoa, if you have the right to set up a statue in Athens, you want to set it up in the most public place, uh, then you're going to set it up uh, right in front of the most public building where all the Athenians came to visit. So this is what we are getting now. This is the last of the public buildings uh, that we have to find in Athens. We have another 15 or 20 years. Uh, but you can see it's the public space. It's the space where the Athenians had to come for a variety of reasons and it is where uh, they express themselves uh, as citizens in both uh, daily life, public, uh, and to an extent private. Thank you very much. We have time for um, about two questions, so. Okay, there's a microphone on either side of the room. If you raise your hand, we can come to you. Right. On the left-hand side, there's a microphone coming to you right in the middle there. Hi, what are the chances of excavating the academy? I'm sorry, your microphone's not as good as mine. Could you say that again? Yeah. Yeah. What are the chances to ex excavating the academy, Plato's academy? Uh, the, it, it would take a lot of money, but that's probably all. But it would take tens of millions of dollars to buy the property. It's Do you think it's going to happen? Uh, I met a man about 10 years ago who said he could and would do it, but I haven't seen him for 10 years. <laughs> <coughs> You mentioned wages of one drachm a day for the people who were working on the Erechtheion, regardless yes. of class. Um, how much was that worth? Would that have been a token payment, or would that have actually been a day's living? We, we, uh, there's a gentleman, he's not in the audience, he's not here tonight, unfortunately, but he's a specialist in wages and prices. And uh, he says uh, that the, the amount that somebody would earn varies a great deal. Uh, and that punches a hole in our notion. If he's not here and he's not here, his wife is here, but she won't tell him. Uh, we all believe that a drachma is a day's wage. So you can tell me whether you make $50, $100, whatever. It is a good wage. Uh, if you're on welfare, you are given a half of that for, 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 uh, to live on. 
uh, and early on in the law courts, they gave you one sixth of a drachma, and then they, if you're a juror, and then they started putting it up uh, to about half a drachma a day. So it, a drachma is a decent day's wage, is what I would have said, but Rob Loomis would say otherwise. In the display upstairs, they mentioned that there were 30,000 citizens in Athens, but they not necessarily counted, if I believe, women or slaves. What would have been the actual population, say, at the height of the classical period of the city itself? Thank you very much. That's a one-hour lecture right there. <laughs> uh, all you can do uh, is guess or count the number of citizens and then multiply by whatever factor you want for women, children, and slaves. Uh, I have one thing to contribute to the discussion. Uh, the first thing I would say, which, which everybody knows, is that if you're a naval power, which Athens was, every one of your warships needs 200 rowers. And we think citizens and free men were the only ones who did that. And they had a fleet of 200 ships. So that means you put 40,000 men uh, out into the field every time you send out the fleet and then another 10,000 hoplites or heavy armed uh, warriors. So your army alone can be 60 or 70,000 people. And the question then is what percentage of the population is that? But the other thing, uh, and again, if you have a house, uh, you put in a husband and a wife, you put in as many kids as you want, do you put in one slave, do you put in four slaves, do you put in eight slaves? And then the other for just inhabitants, uh, the Athenians had a lot of non-resident Greeks, excuse me, non-citizen Greeks who were resident in Athens. And they lived and worked there, and we know a lot about them. They're called medics. And I once read the 10,000 gravestones that we have for Athens, and one-third of them were for Athenians, one-third of them were for medics, and one-third of them you couldn't tell. But statistically, it looks to me like for every Athenian citizen, you had one non-Athenian resident uh, who was a free man, and then you still have the variable of the women and the children, so that's your one-hour lecture. Uh, I would say myself for Attica, which includes down to Sunion and over to Marathon, I would guess between 300 and 500,000 people. But that's, a lot of people don't agree with that at all. That's even, <laughs> That's, and you know, that's even worse than Rob Loomis and his drachma is me telling you how many people were in Athens. I have yep. one last question back here, all the way in the back. Oh. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, there were news uh, below like the statues of the heroes. So who was in control of this news? Where did it come from? Oh, it's the official news. They're right across the street from the Senate building and the archive building. So as soon as there, some, a decree is passed or a decree is proposed, uh, they would write it on a white painted board in charcoal and they would go up and hang it uh, in front of the appropriate statue base or at the end if it had concerned all the Athenians. So when the Senate met, and it met every day except holidays, they would propose something for the citizens. And instead of a House of Representatives, every 10 days all the citizens would come together and they would vote for or against that proposal. And you couldn't vote on that proposal unless it had been displayed at that statue base for three days before the meeting. So you had time to read it and discuss it and argue about it with your friends and family. And you were prepared to vote when you went to the meeting of the full assembly. So it's, it's information that you need from military officers and from political officers about what's going on in the city and who's involved officially. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Ben.